hello friends this is going to be a presentation on mycoplasma pneumonia so in the last few days because this is now winters in the uk we are seeing an increase in the number of uh, respiratory cases in our children's emergency department so it's always full of kids with back-to-back -back respiratory infections but this year there has been a strange thing we are seeing an increase in what we call as radiological pneumonia kids who have got an x-ray evidence of consolidation which might be lobar or segmental and another interesting thing about these kids is that they are well in themselves i mean most of the kids who have got pneumonia you would be thinking that they would be very unwell having a toxic look but no most of these kids are fine and they generally look very well and another one thing we have seen is that the majority of these kids have already been given antibiotics like amoxicillin by their primary care providers but they are failing to respond to those antibiotics so they're still having cough they're still having respiratory symptoms and they still have got fever which might be of low grade or high grade and strangely this coincides with the reports of a mystery pneumonia uh, which has emerged in certain parts of northern china and the who actually asked the chinese authorities about what those mystery cases were and then it was found out that majority of those cases which they label as mystery pneumonia was in fact pneumonia caused by mycoplasma pneumonia which is an organism and we call it as an atypical organisms and the infections caused by them are known as atypical chest infections so to give you a little bit of background of what mycoplasma pneumonia is it is basically an organism it is classified as bacteria but it's a strange bacteria because you would see that it's got like very strange properties they are considered to be like very small organism and they are pleomorphic pleomorphic means that they show a lot of plasticity i mean if you look at the, them unlike other bacteria which have got cell walls this mycoplasma does not have a cell wall and that's one of the reasons that most of the beta lactam antibiotics they do not uh, work on this organism they are ineffective why because there is no cell wall so this is unlike bacteria no cell wall but then is it a virus no it's not even a virus because unlike viruses you know viruses they thrive inside the cells viruses cannot replicate outside the the cells whether they're human cells or animal cells they require a living host but mycoplasma can actually survive outside the uh, the living cells so it can replicate on the surface of the cell so again this is something which is not like viruses so very strange organism not fully bacteria not fully virus something in between and it's considered to be a uh, sort of a prokaryote you know prokaryotes are single cell organisms which can live on their own and unlike eukaryotes which are like like human cells you know eukaryotes have got like a proper mechanism they've got a condensed nuclear material in the center and they've got like a cellular factory in the form of ribosomes and mitochondria uh prokaryotes are um, not like that so because of the lack of cell wall they are not stained by the ground stain so that's why uh, it's very difficult to classify them as a ground positive or ground negative these are altogether a typical organism now most of the times they are associated with like you know they thrive on the mucosal surface so mucosal surface of the respiratory tract or sometimes of the urogenital tract as also mycoplasma and pneumonia basically lives in your respiratory tract and like you know actually colonize that and some of these species like mycoplasma um, hominis and uh, genitalium that can like actually reside on the urogenital tract so it's a strange organism now if i show you the graph i mean in the last uh, I, I want to say this data is basically a decade old but somewhere between 2000 and uh, so between 1995 i think yes it's 1995 and 2011 the uk public health agency which is now known as the uk health security agency they did a sort of a surveillance like this was a microbiological surveillance based on the pcr reports and they found out that every three to four years there was a peak in the incidence of mycoplasma infections so you see there was a peak in 1995 then there was a peak in 1998 99 then a peak in 2003 2006 and then 2011 so roughly every four or five years there is a peak now what happened this time in 2020 we had these covid pandemic so because of the covid pandemic there were lockdowns there was safe social distancing seals like that we call it non-pharmaceutical intervention use of face masks and other things so there was a general decrease in the incidence of non-covid respiratory infections so the bronchiolitis uh, pneumonia this uh, what you call strep pneumonia typical organisms atp everything went down 
So, as the restrictions have been lifted now, we are seeing uh, increase in the number of these cases. The other reason being like, you know, the kids who were born in the last three, four years, they did not have enough immunity against this organism. Now they are like getting infected and that's why we are seeing now a rise. So this was reported in China and now as in UK, we are also seeing cases every day uh, of especially of mycoplasma pneumonia. So every three to four years, global peaks, they do occur more so this time because we had a lot of restriction in the last three to four years and now they're being lifted is causing a rise in the number of these atypical infections. This is another like um, uh, data from a microbiological surveillance. So based on the samples that, uh, you know, certain laboratory received and they did further like they did culture sensitivity for the typical organisms or PCR for atypical organism. They found out that somewhere between in 2017 to 2020, and this data is from UK again, between 2017 and 2020, around like 8.6% of the samples, they were positive for plasma pneumonia. And then in the COVID times, it went down. So it went down to around like, you know, 1.56% in 2021. Then it even went below 1% 1 in 2021, 22. And this was maintained till the end of 2022. And since the beginning of 2023, in the, from March to September, we are seeing a gradual rise in the number of uh, samples, you know, the positivity rate of the samples. So for right from under 1%, this has jumped to over 4% in the first six months and is further on the rise as the winter fully sets in. So this is just simply showing that mycoplasma pneumonia based infections are on the rise. Now, a little bit about the pathophysiology. I mean, I will just quickly go through that. So basically, it's an organism, it's a pleomorphic organism, it does not have a cell wall, it just like, you know, resides on the respiratory epithelium and it simply would hide between the, you know, the cilia of the respiratory epithelium goes inside from there, it enters the cell by attaching to the cell membrane, certain proteins help in facilitate that and goes inside the cell then starts dividing and in the process, it can produce like, you know, pro like a the superoxide radicals like uh, hydrogen peroxide and it just like you know um, you know sort of destroy the host cells and that's how the cells are destroyed and the organism then you know uh, infects other like uh, cells and just carries on doing its its job but it's at a so place so that's why usually these these patients are not very ill they do exhibit symptoms but these are like slowly evolving symptoms Moving on to the epidemiology of this, like uh, the global burden and the things like that, I mean, causes atypical infections. Now, atypical infections usually are more common in the, well, I mean, to some extent, they are present in every age group there, but they're more common in the young people. So, so you would say like 5 to 18, 20 years old, mostly atypical infections occur in this age group. It's quite rare for kids less than five years to have mycoplasma infection but i tell you one thing in uk we are do we are seeing actually cases less than five years of age who have got a typical chest infection anyhow the highest rate as i told you is in young adults like between 5 to 18 or 20 years of age and it is um, spread by you know droplet infection aerosol so somebody coughing sneezing even through hand contact so you know these are the common methods by which the organism was spread from one person to the other person. Moving on how this uh, thing presents like basically this is insidious onset of so it usually starts with the uh, cough and chorizal symptoms so it always starts like a common cold but you can call it a common cold plus because on the face value it looks like it's a prolonged flu-like symptom so people start with having a runny nose, a sore throat, a cough no fever or mild grade fever but then you know normally most of the viruses would go away in five to seven days now this just lingers on so you might have treated these children with just like you say okay well fine it looks like a viral infection just carry on with the supportive treatment but somehow the things slowly and gradually they get worse and some are even treated with inhalers they don't work some are treated with conventional antibiotics and the common one amoxicillin which is like sort of the arsenal for primary care physicians whenever they think like they just prescribe it but because of lack of cell wall these antibiotics are not effective so what would happen even if they've taken antibiotics even if they're taking healers somehow there is persistence of symptomatology so they've got a low grade fever they might be having a bit of lethargy tired they might have headache can have chills but they don't have rigors because rigors are usually associated with other like acute viruses or some of the bacteria they can have like a sore throat things like that so very much resembles 
common cold but the only thing is that it's it it persists it goes beyond one week okay you might see cases like even after 10 days 12 days they still have got these symptoms troublesome symptoms so the thing is that if you do a chest x-ray you will see the chest x-ray usually has got some you know shadows and that's why the common saying is that the x-ray looks more bad than the patient themselves i will come to that in a moment but anyhow as i said like it usually has got cough and cold like symptoms which persist for a prolonged period of time if that if that's the the scenario think of a typical uh, infection especially caused by mycoplasma pneumonia some of the less uh, common presenting features are they can have like you know ear ache they can have like body aches uh, rarely because of prolonged cough they can have sort of chest pain pleuritic chest pain as well and rarely it can have interesting extra uh, pulmonary phenomena as well like mycoplasma is known to cause steven johnson syndrome which is actually sort of i know uh, reaction in which you have got mucous membrane and skin involvement like there are bullet blister target lesions different type of polymorphic eruptions on the skin and sometimes it can lead to a very like sort of a life-threatening condition so steven johnson syndrome is a known complication rarely it can cause many encephalitis arthritis and gi symptoms like vomiting and diarrhea but they're quite rare as far as examination like you know when you examine these they look well i mean this is general non-toxic appearance so some people also call it walking pneumonia so x-ray shows something but they're walking they're not ill i mean they look fine despite the persistence of symptomatology chest examination could be very much unspecific so you might find a normal chest or you might find like there are a bit of like crackles maybe ronca a little bit of v's as well one thing that is quite peculiar to this mycoplasma is that uh, you might see erythematous tympanic membranes there's no like sort of a uh, otitis meet anything but just that the tympanic membranes are very much hyperemic and sometimes they can have mucositis as well so like for example kids with fever and having you know some sort of blisters and scabs on their lips so that could be another presentation quite unique to mycoplasma infections as far as investigations are concerned well honestly speaking except chest x-ray nothing else is helpful blood test might show something in most of the cases it would be normal you might see a little bit of elevated CRP, you might see elevated of WBC or you might not see them. Now, serological tests, the antibody, ELISA tests, the things, they are have got low sensitivity, low specificity, so they're not done as a routine practice. The only one good method is uh, what we call as the real-time quantitative PCR. It's a very expensive one. It's not done routine in hospitals. I mean, maybe the public health agencies, they do it as a part of a surveillance system. So where they are like, you know, keeping things under the radar screen so they might have like sort of a uh, you know formal uh, linkages with the laboratories okay in which they can from time to time they can look at the samples and run these real-time uh, quantitative pcrs to see if the burden is increasing or not so but that is just for surveillance purposes not done for clinical purposes the only one thing is chest x-ray so chest x-ray can show many things chest x-ray either shows in most of the cases non-specific bilateral patches so these are patchy consolidations you know sort of a non-specific uh, small patches in both lung fields so you know you can see it in the both lower lung zones or in the perihilar areas or sometimes rarely in the apical areas that are non-specific i mean you can make different meanings of that even a child who has got chronic viral disease or who suffers from asthma might have like some of these changes so it's very difficult to pick them up but in most of the cases you might see some sort of bronchopneumonic changes small patches of segmental consolidation here and there so this happens in most of the cases but rarely you can also see x-rays like this one so here this is the case that was seen by me this was a girl who was uh, having you know fever for the last nine ten days a low-grade fever was having cough already had taken a course of amoxicillin had finished it no improvement the only chest was strangely chest was even clear to auscultation i mean with this you will be thinking that there would be many crackles no the only thing was that you know she had a bit of tachypnea and sats were sometimes going low as well so we did a chest x-ray and this is what we found also there's a uh, you can see right lower low consolidation and uh, this was a typical infection so we started her on uh, clarithromycin she just got better within started improving within three days and she finished a seven days course and got absolutely better i will show you another x-ray <clears throat> this is another boy 
uh, around 14 15 years of age he was having fever he was having dry cough he was having headache and generalized body aches or something everything else was fine and because uh, you had cough and we had low threshold these days we are seeing these cases we did a chest x-ray and you can see that he's got left lower lobe uh, consolidation so again we started this boy on azithromycin and he got better with that so you can have non-specific changes or you can have specific radiological low bar consolidation as you saw in these cases as far as the treatment is concerned uh, treatment if you have to treat them uh, treatment suggested that you carry on for seven to ten days normally the hallmark of the first line treatment for this uh, types of infections are macrolides so erythromycin clarithromycin azithromycin roxithromycin you can use any one of them erythromycin because it's got qds dosages and because of palatability issues we have seen that usually the compliance is a bit poor with erythromycin so i usually recommend clarithromycin in a dose of 15 milligram per kg per day in two divided doses and you can go up to seven to ten days or you can give azithromycin 10 milligram per kg you can give it for five days so macrolides are the first line of treatment having a very good response there are some reports of macrolide resistant atypical infections but as far as european continent is concerned we don't have much of this problem over here yes in south asia uh, you can have that so in that cases where you've got macrolide resistant atypical infections, then there we recommend that you give them tetracycline doxycycline it's a very good drug provided the child is greater than eight years of age you can give them oral doxycycline in a dose of uh, depends which book are you following but here in uk we start them on like the first day dose is 4.4 milligram per kg and then from next day to day seven we uh, give them 2.2 milligram per kg or uh, we can give them ciprofloxacin or uh, levofloxacin uh, as an alternative uh, because maybe uh, you cannot use doxycycline less than eight years of age so where if you think there is a macrolide resistance you can go with ciprofloxacin ciprofloxacin has also got a very good like you know sort of coverage against atypical organisms so either ciprofloxacin or levofloxacin but the first line are macrolides if it doesn't work either tetracyclines or chloroquinolones for seven to ten days and then this in most of the cases would uh, you know resolve the atypical infection if you are not sure about uh, you know or if you are in a restored con uh, what we call as resource constraint setting in that particular case then we recommend that you give them empirical therapy till you are clear about that so empirical therapy means you cover the typical organisms like the gram positives one so you can give them comoxiclav and you can all at the same time cover the atypical one by giving them clarithromycin so if you give a combination of two antibiotics comoxiclav and clarithro or azithro depending on your local policy you can give them like you know a broad coverage till you are clear whether it's being caused by a typical organism or a typical organism then you can tailor it accordingly but by and large if you know it's an atypical infection as i told you macrolides or tetracyclines or fluoroquinolones so that was all about like atypical chest infections caused by mycoplasma pneumonia which is on the rise here in the uk at least where i work we are seeing an increase in cases and i thought that i would make a presentation because this is something interesting we are seeing this year not too much you know we talk about so hope you like this lecture you learned something new if you've got any question put your question down in the comment section below i'll be more than happy to answer your queries have a very good day take care uh, bye bye and please don't forget to share this video with your friends and if you have liked it uh, smash that like button and you haven't subscribed please do subscribe it helps take care bye bye